Uh, we're delighted to be given the opportunity to speak today. The ability to demonstrate the impact that we are making in investment is more important than ever considering the DCMS strategy that's recently been released. The new focus on broader outcomes, which I know we've heard a lot about in this morning's presentations, um, is something the Foundation strongly believes in and is something that we will both be looking at internally and externally with the organisations that we work with. As an organisation, we pride ourselves on the continuous improvements and systems and tools that we have created to be able to demonstrate our impact. However, we will be honest, it's not been an easy journey for us, but we'd like to share those lessons and experiences with you today. We've managed to get the presentation down to just 25 slides, which we find quite impressive between the three of us. I will run you through the Football Foundation's journey. Tara will then probably lecture you on the importance of monitoring and evaluation. And then we will hear from Julia, who is someone who has um, succumbed to our lecturing and our suggestions on monitoring and evaluation. Um, but we aim to leave, hopefully, a little bit of time for questions. Um, whilst not delaying you before the most, in slot, most important slot of the day, which is lunch. Just to give you a brief, brief overview of the Football Foundation, um, if you don't know who we are already, we are the UK's largest sports charity. We, we're funded um, by the Premier League and the FA and the government since 2000. Ultimately what we do is we support the modernisation of grassroots across England. We've awarded to date 14,000 grants worth 547 million. We also, that is with a lot of partnership funding as well. Um, so in total we're looking at 1.3 billion of investment which is absolutely huge but that is not to say that the problems are not over as we will go on to tell you. Um, we also deliver kind of white label programmes for the CSR programme Barclays Spaces for Sport, something that we've delivered over the last 11 years and we also deliver Greater London, Author Greater London Authority Mayor of London Sports Facilities Fund. Um, it's important to say that we are an independent and impartial delivery capability, which is why our football partners invest in us. Just to give you an idea of the, pro of the problems that we're facing, it kind of says here from the, from the surveys that we've been looking at, the FA Grassroots Survey, which was, um, came out in December last year, still says that 84% of respondents cited poor facilities as their single most pressing issue. As, as you can see on the top of the slide, 94% without female changing rooms and still 38% with no changing rooms at all. So poor facilities is going to be a constant barrier to the direct impact of football participation and talent development within this country unless we address it. The current strategy that we've been working on over the last three years, um, we have three key objectives. That's to increase participation levels, and that's a 5% target. We work closely with professional football clubs to create those strong links to um, help the talent pathway development. And we also invest in deprived communities. 40% of our investment has to be in 20% of the most deprived areas. So ultimately, what the Football Foundation does is improve facilities, create opportunities and build communities. We turn these somewhat shoddy buildings and foot waterlogged pitches into shiny facilities that we hope entice people to come and play. However, our impact. So we've identified the problem. The problem is we don't have enough facilities that are suitable for people to participate. We built the strategy along with our funding partners. We now need to get on and build the new facilities, which we have been doing for the last 16 years. But how do we measure and how do we demonstrate the impact back to our funding partners? Back in 2006, we implemented a performance management system, which means we track projects end to end, a through life approach, right from the start of the application through to the completion, and then 21 years beyond that. That ensures that we've carefully managed and delivered in a timely manner, 
um, right through to the end stage, and then we monitor and evaluate on an annual basis. Understanding the impact of the projects helps us to support the projects that may be struggling. Whilst the rates of the m and have been relatively good on return, we were, we, and we were able to demonstrate sustainability, success and impact, there were certainly problems we needed to address to make us more efficient and, and effective as an organisation. So, the problems we faced back in 2009, interesting uh, images we've chosen, chosen to represent here, our grant recipients were having to spend hours days, sometimes weeks, actually collating all of their data from the entire year. We only asked them to report back to us once a year, which meant that, for the most of them, they waited until the end of the year to capture all that data or to bring it all together and report back to us. As a result of that, there ended up being holes in that data. If I'm looking back at registers from June last year and I've got a hand in my reports, chances are there are going to be some <coughs> registers missing, case notes missing. And as a result, the reports that we're putting together are not going to be as accurate as they could be. There's a lot of expertise at the Football Foundation that we could provide and support our grant recipients with. But if we didn't know that a project or a program was struggling, there was nothing that we could do to help. And of course, because we didn't find out until the end of the year that this was the case, it was often too late. A lot of these organisations as well, because they weren't doing monitoring and evaluation throughout the year, didn't necessarily know themselves that they were going to be struggling to hit their own targets. Again, by the end of the year, it was too late to do anything about it. We also had data coming back in lots of different formats. We had spreadsheets, we had pieces of paper coming through the post, some emails coming through, other systems being used. It was very difficult for us to collate that data, bring it all together and actually see you know, who was doing well, who was struggling, where do we need to focus more of our energy in. And it was also very difficult for us to spot any trends or patterns that we should focus on going forward. So we established a committee who were charged with exploring how to process capturing data that could be more modernised. What did we need? What were we looking for? We needed some evidence It was easy to, that was easy to enter and up-to-date and complete information. We needed to see the visibility, but most importantly, we needed it for easy to input. Outsourcing. We did actually previously outsource some of our monitoring and evaluation. But ultimately, we needed all the data stored in one place for us to easily access. We needed it to be efficient. We really wanted to move, back in 2009, from the idea of being paper-based onto online, automatic and live. That meant live, real tracking time, easily, easily, easily to return on investment. We needed to have impact, the capability to collate, analyse and report across projects to demonstrate the overall project impact. And finally, we needed to cost save. As with most organisations in this room, monitoring and evaluation is probably one of the things where there's not much money for us to do that. So we needed to meet internal needs with all the requirements of what our funding partners were asking us to do whilst reducing those costs. When we decided on this back in 2009, we also thought, what do the organisations we work with need? What do they want from a system? And you know, we could have said, right, we know what they want, let's just go ahead and build it. But we thought, actually, let's go out and ask them what it is they want from a system that we can create for them. So these are some of the things that they were saying back in 2009. And it'd be interesting to see if any of these are still relevant to people today. And that final quote circled at the bottom there, if there was a direct benefit to us of providing this information, I'd be much more willing to do it. Makes sense. And it was something that really resonated with us when we decided to build our own system. 
So we created Upshot, and one of the first ideas that we had was how are we going to make something that's going to have a direct impact and benefit on the people who are actually going to have to put in those registers, create that information, so that others can report on it. So we looked at other modern applications that people use on a day-to-day -day basis. Facebook, Twitter, Amazon. No one forces them to use these applications. People input their data because they want to. It benefits them to do that. So what we wanted to do with Upshot was provide an explicit benefit to those delivering the work on the ground. If the users become interested in the system, they're much more likely to be motivated to actually use it. So it's been four years since we launched Upshot and what is our success to date? Well, we certainly recognise it has addressed our needs internally, um, but it's also addressed needs of other organisations, sports organisations, national governing bodies, sports partners, but also other health organisations, universities, local authorities and crime prevention units. All the investment that we receive is invested back into the system. It's continually improving with the developments as like with any other technology product. It's improved our return rate on monitoring and evaluation for the Football Foundation from 70 to 90 percent and that is a huge, huge impressive kind of rate for us to achieve and we will continue to, uh, we will continue to make sure that that increases however I think 90 percent is something that we will probably not improve on a great deal. Um, and ultimately, it's, it's increased our visibility that we wanted. We were able to compare things across projects like we wanted to with our original needs. So moving on to me lecturing you all about monitoring and evaluation. I'm going to talk today mainly about quantitative or qualitative data. Um, I might refer to them as numbers or stories instead, because it can be a bit difficult to keep saying quantitative and qualitative and not get completely tongue-tied. So a lot of the organisations that I, I work with as part of Upshot don't necessarily know what sort of data to collect at the beginning. Um, I normally say, you know, look at what you want to deliver, look at the outcomes that you're trying to achieve here. But a lot of people get lost in you know, the different types of data capture that you can do. So what I'm going to do is run through some of the pros and cons, generic pros and cons of numbers and stories, and then look at what you should be looking at in your own organisations and have a think about what your requirements should be. So looking at just collecting numbers, which I think a lot of us tend to do because it, it is it, it's easier. You know, it's easier to gather the data, it takes less time, which means you're more likely you're not like as likely to have resistance from your recipients when you're asking them for this data, or from your deliverers, people on the ground who are actually having to collect that data. As a result, it tends to be cheaper, and you can monitor much larger groups. It also tends to be easier to spot patterns or trends, and you can then create target groups of individuals that you want to find out more about. What is it about your program that they're enjoying or not? But there are cons to the number side as well. It doesn't necessarily give you full, the full picture. There's not so much insight when it comes to the number side of things when you've just got hard statistics. It also means that important information could be asked. If you're only giving someone a single or a multiple choice question and no room to actually give their own input, you're not going to find out the reasons why behind those numbers. And they're not likely to volunteer it just by themselves. Just looking at numbers, there can be a lack of understanding as to what those mean, which gives the danger of it being misinterpreted. And when it comes to collecting numbers, there is so much choice in what you can collect that organisations can become overwhelmed and end up collecting the wrong stuff. So it can tell you, you know, if you've hit your targets or you've missed your targets, 
but it doesn't tell you why. To give you an example, if you know you need to target more women, older generations, young people of neat status, do you actually know what the barriers are to your sport specifically for them? And I don't just mean any physical barriers, but what about fear or embarrassment or how comfortable they feel participating? We can all make assumptions, but we can't ease these challenges if we don't know what they are. Moving on to the qualitative side of things. It can give you a really detailed picture of what's happened with your participants and track their journey over a period of time. It can also provide insight which you otherwise might have missed or not thought about. And it gives you reasons behind the numbers. It provides the meaning behind them. It can help to inform you what and how you can improve, but also what shouldn't be changed. What do you think in your programme is actually an, a nice bonus? Could actually be vital to some of the people that you work with. So when you're thinking about kind of data to collect, what ways, apart from an increase in physical activity, which I think a lot of us do collect, what ways can we show the effect we've had on our participants? What about an increase in knowledge, improvement in attitudes, or a sense of well-being? Qualitative data can really help in measuring these things. But likewise, there are cons to collecting this sort of data. It can be a lot more time consuming, and as a result, more expensive. It can be difficult to capture. You've got to get buy-in from your participants and from your deliverers when it comes to collecting this data. Not all of your participants are going to want to sit down and talk for five, ten minutes or longer about their experience in your program. So you've got to go out and find those people. And if it's your coaches or whoever it is collecting that data, they've got to be bought into it as well because they're the ones who are going to have to take the time away from delivering in order to collect this data. Because it's much more nuanced, there's, it's much more difficult to see patterns or comparisons between your data sets. It takes a lot longer. And an individual might know why they did something, why they engaged more or less. But they don't know, and you're unlikely to know, if their experience is shared or unique. Because you've got a smaller response rate, you've got less clarity, and there is potential for more bias. So, problems when it comes to deciding on what to collect. Monitoring and evaluation is vital to show your worth. But it's only useful if you're collecting the right data. And it's not always easy to know what that right data should be. More and more funders are demanding monitoring and evaluation as part of their requirements. But if this is not thought about in advance, it can quite quickly eat into delivery budgets. Most, and I say most, it's not the case for everyone, but most deliverers signed up to deliver, not to do monitoring and evaluation. A large proportion don't necessarily see the value of it, but they're the ones who are in the position to collect that data. And if they're not bought in, it's very difficult to actually report on anything. M&E can be time consuming and expensive, and unless it's well thought out in advance, you can end up left with worthless data. And unless you, the data is being gathered is tracked throughout delivery, when it comes to reporting, you can find that there are holes in the data. And let's be honest, reporting back to your funders is often a painfully long task. So just some solutions or an ideas. I'm not saying this is will fix everyone's problem, because everyone has their own requirements. But just some ideas. Invest time in considering your m and before you apply for funding. Promise only what's feasible and think about your objectives as well as theirs. Consider what you want to learn. 
How difficult or easy is this data going to be to collect? And what is it going to tell you or your funders? What difference is it going to make apart from you know, checking the right boxes? Communicate with and consider your deliverers, the people on the ground actually delivering your work. How much time do they have to collect this data? How is it going to benefit them? Do they know it will benefit them? And even if you tell them this is going to benefit you, do they actually agree with you that it will? What do you know about the benefits of the work you deliver? What are you actually just assuming are the benefits? And what could you learn? Do you know what areas you struggle with and why? None of us have perfect programs. And if you don't know, how can you find out? How do you want to gather this data? In what format? Is it going to be spreadsheets? A tailor-made bespoke system that you've designed? An off-the-shelf system via consultants? I would suggest that you look at the cost versus the benefit versus your problems with each option. There's not a one-size-fits-all in this case. And we all have different requirements. Going back to who will gather this data, one of those methods that I mentioned might be best for you, but what method is going to be best for them? What are they going to be happy to use? And if there are any funders in the room, what are your responsibilities to your delivery partners? How should you be helping them to accomplish the goals that you've set for them? It's not necessarily just about the money. So, do we start with quantitative? Do we start with qualitative? Just to give you an example. Quantitative can mean that you, you know what you need to improve, and qualitative can mean that you know what and how you need to improve. But it's not necessarily a linear process. Quantitative can lead to qualitative. E.g., you find out X target group are not attending your program on a regular basis. So you decide to interview that target group to find out why. But then you go and you interview those individuals and you find out the reasons you hadn't previously considered. Now this is just a small sample of your attendees. So what you might want to do is go back to the quantitative methods, survey them all again and find out if, if this is a common trend that you need to tackle. can be a vicious cycle. So to summarise, just three bullet points really. First of all, ask yourselves, why do you want or need to know this? A lot of organisations that I speak to for the first time when I ask them what they want to collect, they respond to this question with, we've, because we've always collected it like this, we've always delivered the project like this. Circumstances change, and what was right then might not be now. You might have more or less resources. Your priorities might have changed. The local community might have different needs. The overall sporting strategy has changed. What change could it affect, if any? If some of the data isn't going to change anything, it's a waste of everyone's time trying to collect it. And don't try to implement everything at once if you're starting from scratch. Baby steps are still better than doing nothing. The amount of times that I've spoken to an organization for the first time and they've apologized to me for how bad their monitoring and evaluation has been in the past. There's literally no need to apologize for what's happened in the past when it comes to monitoring and evaluation, especially not to me. There's a huge range in the sophistication of different organizations, m and &E, and feeling guilty about not having been monitoring and evaluation superstars is only going to discourage you from actually progressing. So with the danger of starting to sound like a life coach here, don't beat yourselves up on this. Just decide what you're going to do about it, what do you want to improve, how can you improve, and where do you want to start? 
So now I'm going to hand over to Julia to talk about the RFL's journey. Um, obviously, we're running a little bit behind time, so I don't think we're going to have any time for questions at the end. But if anyone does have any questions, we have got a stall in the next room, and you're more than welcome to come and have a chat with us. Thank you. I'm actually sitting there smiling to myself, thinking that Yorkshire last from Hull I'm going to talk about monitoring and evaluating when she, all she wants to do is play rugby league. 20 years in sport development, I don't think that would have ever been the case. So monitoring and evaluating five years ago was something that at the RFL we had to begin to take seriously. Skytry, uh, we were lucky as a sport that Sky came in and wanted to invest nine million in rugby league over a seven year period. We could invest it in whatever we liked. There's not many funders out there that will actually allow you to do what you like with your money. So we suddenly had unring fenced money and we could do what we like in our sport in order to develop our sport. So we came up with a bit of a package, uh, hit all the areas that we couldn't with basically with government funding, with Sport England funding, um, the areas where we knew we needed to grow our sport but we couldn't because the funding wasn't out there in other funding pots. So one was looking around primary rugby league, secondary, girls touch and actually making the big games bigger, getting more supporters in. There became our dilemma. Um, very much as, as uh, they've described here, we were on Excel spreadsheets um, working with 27 foundations trying to find out how many um, participants were participating in all our local communities. We wanted to make a step change with this funding. So driven by the principles of making a difference, we then decided how we wanted to do things and we got all our, basically Skytry is delivered through our foundations which is all the charities of the Rugby Football League cl uh, clubs. With them we wanted to make sure that we delivered long term growth through outcomes and impacts and you can now see where we're beginning to create the story and why we've got a partnership with Upshot. We wanted to make sure our products were uniformed because what was happening in London wasn't necessarily what was happening in the North East. It was very, very different to the coaching and we wanted to make sure the delivery d developed that growth. We wanted accountability through the programme and return on investment. Sky weren't just giving us those, that nine million, they wanted to see a difference. And how did we actually begin to prove that difference? Plus, it was the start of our journey on governance excellence. We hadn't really challenged our foundations around the governance and we needed to start doing that. A big thing and a big part of it, which is around the fans and making the big game bigger, was it's no use going to a professional rugby league club and just talking about getting more, partic more participants. That means nothing to them. It's about the numbers of people that are on their terraces that they want to increase. So this was a big part of what we were trying to drive. And also we wanted to prove what we were trying to deliver through academic research. So, all right, having the idealist, idealist, idealist I, idealism um, that we wanted to deliver but we then needed to look at how we delivered it and how we best worked in partnership to make that happen so that's when we got together with Upshot um, we were, had all those outcomes and those principles and we wanted to make sure that it, it added all the, that, the value and things so 27 found, Rugby League foundations are with Upshot now they're with various uh, delivery partners. They've all got a license. It's part of their agreement that they had to, to um, work with Upshot. I must say, for all those in the room, Upshot is only go as good as the information you actually put in it. It's like any other monitoring and evalu evaluation system. So we have worked hard with our foundations to ensure, one, they had the initial tutorial, then they've had lots of one-to-ones in order to make sure the data that they put in gives us the information that we need out at the other end. Um, Warrington Wolves, a particular uh, club and foundation, have used this exceptionally. Bear in mind a lot of our rugby league foundations had played around with monitoring and, and, and evaluation. Um, some of them have taken it on wholesale, Warrington Wolves being one of them. They now monitor all the programmes on Upshot. They've really found it useful for getting other funding. They can do case studies, they can do all the governance on it, they can do the questionnaires. Um, to all the participants through the information that they have actually put in, it's all in one place. It is easy for them to input, so they can all on their iPhones input the data and actually put it off into the system so the coaches find it easy. Um, 
they can actually get real-time numbers. So at any point in time, I can put Warrington Wolves or anyone's up here, and we can tell you what they're doing at the moment, where the coaches are, where they intend to be, um, what they intend to do in the, in the future, which is really, really important for us to be able to demonstrate to Sky that they're getting value for money. The other thing is around the accountability. When it was on Excel spreadsheets, they lied. Um, who's saying that they're not lying now? Well, we now have Mr Shoppers that go out and when they say they're in a calendar or a school at a, a particular time, we can go and see whether they're actually doing those activities and check and challenge and make sure the data they are putting in is what they're actually beginning to do. I am one, as some of those might have been in, just put numbers in bids because they ask for those numbers. With Upshot and being able to find that accountability, we now have it in real time and the actual ac accurate numbers in order to move it forward. And I think it's all in one place. Um, that is the major thing for us and our foundations. They have everything in one place, so the data, the governance, the case studies, the reports. They just input that data and they can get everything out of that system. It's only a year into the programme, so we're still seeing te teething problems. But we have such confidence in the system and the fact that it actually works for us. We're now looking at Rugby League Cares, which is our charity, of using it with six pilot projects uh, that we're running with decommissioning money from Sport England. So we fully believe that actually it does make a difference. You can have your reports, your case studies, it is all in one place and it's well worth investigating to use for the future. Thank you.